Got things up and running now. Okay. And um, yeah, welcome to another Science Tavern. We have a great guest, Kristen Emmett. Um, she's going to be giving us some lowdown on how our forests are changing and the tools that we've been using to do the research on that. Um, just a quick note, we will, I am going to be putting in some donation links to help us cover the meetup.com costs. So if you feel like Science Tavern has given you some knowledge and access to really great scientists, um, please consider giving us a donation so that we can continue these talks um, for free and you know, bringing great speakers to the public. Um, and um, just so you know, I will also be you know, linking to our YouTube channel so you can see all of our other talks that have gone down since things have been virtual on Zoom. You know, we usually host things in person, um, but that's enough of me spieling. I will give over the floor to our speaker. Thank you all for showing up. Thanks. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Um, my name's Kristen Emmett and I'm a postdoc. That means I've, uh, after my PhD, I got a job uh, and I'm working with the Forest Service at the Southern Research Station um, in Asheville. And I work with a, a great team of folks. So the stuff I'm sharing today is, is work that I'm leading, um, but Lars Pramara, Kurt Ritters, Tim Todd Schroeder, who are all with the Forest Service, um, are the rest of my research team. And uh, it's really, this is a product of, of their work as well and, and their areas of expertise. So I wanna thank them. Um, and I also want to thank the Science Tavern for having me here today to, to give this talk. Um, and particularly Jill invited me, Jill Yeager, who uh, helps coordinate, invited me to give this talk. So thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, and so with that, uh, I'm going to get started. Uh, I'm going to talk for a while, uh, tell some stories, and get into some data. Um, we'll kind of bounce back and forth that way. And uh, I'll take questions at the end. and. Um, yeah, I, I think we'll just get going. Um, so first, you know, one of your missions of the Science Tavern is to humanize science. And so I am going to do a little autobiographical storytelling as we go through and learn about forest change in the Southeast. Um, so the first thing that you need to know is that um, I was born and raised in southwestern Virginia in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and from an early age, I love spending time outside. And uh, this is a picture of uh, Sharp Top Mountain, which is um, Peaks of Otter, if you've ever been there. Um, and in our family, we had a tradition. It was a rite of passage um, that you had to, at a very young age, hike to the top. And when you made it to the top, it was you know, symbolic of- If anything's of happening, I can't hear it. Uh, can everyone else um, hear me okay? Maybe try. Leave. I hear you yeah. fine. Cat you hears you fine. If you have fine. audio issues. Yeah, if you, if you leave and, and rejoin the meeting, we'll let you in and hopefully that'll solve your audio issues. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, anyway, so, so uh, hiking's always been a big part of my life. Um, so... I don't know if there's ways of raising hands in the group, but maybe in chat you can share if, if you're a hiker too. I imagine um, living in, in Asheville, a lot of you like to get outside. So in chat, let me know if you, if you like to go hiking or on, on long walks. Um, so our, our story today is going to talk about some of my long walks in the forest and how through that I've helped, it's helped me see the forest for the trees. Um, and also inspired me to learn about how forests are changing in my lifetime. Uh, so I ended up moving in high school out to the Pacific Northwest. Um, but when I graduated high school, I wanted to reconnect to my roots and I came up with an idea for another rite of passage um, to hike a section of the Appalachian Trail uh, back here and in Southwest Virginia where I grew up. Um, so it was my first long walk in the woods. You know, I'd done day hikes, but 
decided I was going to try backpacking. And I don't know how many backpackers there are, but um, my first trip, I decided to go 10 days and like 111 miles. Um, so in, in retrospect, it was, you know, kind of audacious, but I tend to like, you know, jumping in the deep end with things. Um, yeah, so I, I took on that challenge. I survived, right? I'm talking to you here today. Uh, we got all the miles hiked. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a learning experience. But one of the uh, things that really stood out to me was that even though we were in the woods, you know, we're hiking in the forest, most of the time we were always within earshot of the road. You know, you could hear cars and airplanes. Um, we did lots of road crossings. Um, and we also did <laughs> lots of fence crossings. Um, so, you know, we were going between different land uses, even though we were, you know, supposedly walking in the woods on a trail. Um, so this is just a picture showing one of these fence crossings and, um, and then the symbol for the, for the Appalachian Trail. And uh, considering how many of these we crossed, I started to wonder if that's what the symbol actually represents. And if it does, maybe let me know in chat because I'm, I'm curious. But um, anyway, it was, it was amusing to us. Um, but through this experience, you know, I really started wondering about the extent of forest. Um, and especially having, you know, at that point, you know, lived on the West Coast and the Pacific Northwest and then come back here, um, it really uh, stood out to me more about the fragmentation of the forest. And I wanted to know more about that. Um, so that takes us to the first um, theme today, thinking about landscape context. And so landscape context is really important. So it's not just about, you know, where the forests are, but um, what's surrounding those forests and how have those contexts changed over time? That's what we're calling landscape context. Today, we're really going to focus on uh, different land uses and how those are juxtaposed uh, amongst forested areas. And also, we're going to take a look at just forest cover and forest density. Um, but, you know, I work for the, uh, alongside the Forest Service now, and we have objectives to make sure that our public lands are sustainable, healthy, and productive, that we have resilient forests that are adaptive over time. Um, and so uh, for the work that I was hired to do, um, we were interested in looking at this landscape context and also forest disturbance and recovering dynamics, uh, and then forest conditions, more like what's happening on the ground. Um, so we're going to be talking about those different themes today. And fortunately, we can leverage satellite images. Um, so there's hundreds of satellites circling the globe, giving us all kinds of data. And some of them are particularly taking uh, pictures of the Earth for us to understand what's happening at the Earth's surface. Um, so we're going to take a look at landscape context using satellite images, again, land use and forest density. We'll get into some forest disturbance indicators. And we'll also look at changes in our forest canopy and indicators like composition, productivity, and seasonality. So uh, the project that I was hired to do, we call Landscape Drivers of Forest Change. And the overall goal is to provide an understanding of the relationships between landscape context, forest dynamics, and forest conditions, and to advance forest monitoring assessment and planning efforts, because really the big picture is, is the sustainability of forest. So uh, our project follows a co-development framework. And what I mean by that is from the beginning, we have science management integration from the early stages of research planning throughout the research process. Um, so I have a smaller research team with those folks I mentioned, Lars, Kurt, and Todd, and myself. Um, and we kind of framed the overall project, but we gathered together a really talented group of other stakeholders, primarily within the Forest Service, but also including tribal and, and NGO members. 
or non-government organization members. Um, and in our group, we have representation of forest managers and planners, um, and then also at the regional scale, planners and scientists. And we also, within uh, the research group, we have a lot of different disciplines represented from actually five different research units within the Forest Service. Um, so together through workshops, we agreed upon um, a co-developed project charter, which is kind of unusual um, to, to do this collective uh, project design. So again, our overall objective is to provide this understanding. Um, and a lot of the interest of our stakeholders were around these what, where, when questions. So what has been the spatial and temporal variability and landscape context in the Southern region over the past several decades? And what has been the spatial, spatial distribution of these changes and where do these distributions differ? So that's what we're gonna be looking at um, today. And we're gonna start with uh, landscape context. So the figure here, um, we're gonna start on the right. Um, maybe some of you have seen like a soil texture triangle before um, where it's ratios of sand, silt, and clay. If you're gardeners, that might be familiar to you. Um, you know, we're really heavy on the clay here, but um, you always wanna have a good ratio. So in this case, uh, we're looking at the ratio of a landscape um, that is natural, or agriculture or developed. And so on the left, this is looking at those mosaics and uh, from 2001 to 2016. And the thing I want you to take a look at is there's this core forested area. Um, and in 2016, um, some of that forest interior is still intact, but the surrounding context has changed. So if we look at the Southern region um, and we're defining the Southern region uh, using the Forest Service regions. And so it's 13 states from Virginia down to Florida across to Texas. So it's a pretty large geographic area. Um, and we've produced maps of this changing landscape context. And here it's looking at uh, change in development status. So the gray areas, um, were developed and stayed developed, and then red areas are showing increase. So at this scale, um, it's kind of hard to, to get a, a sense of, of the change that's happening. So I took a couple examples. Um, so this is looking at the at, uh, Atlanta metropolitan area. Um, and some of you that have lived in this area for a while might have been witness to some of this development that's happened over time. Um, so the important things here are, you know, the red is showing recent development and shifts from low development to high development means there's been an intensification of development and areas that were not developed and have become developed, we can think of that as an increase in extent or extentification. And notably, this development is expanding outward from the urban center. If we take a look here in Asheville metropolitan area, um, smaller area, but similar trends. So uh, we're, we're seeing some of that intensification and extentification and around the periphery um, expanding outwards from the urban center. Um, so this is the only table in the presentation. So it's the, the most numbers I'll, show, I'll throw at you. And really it's just to say that we looked at all the pixels. That means like the individual little grid cells for these maps and sum them all up to look at the change in area um, and some trends emerge. So if we just focus on the change column, for all land areas, we see a, a decrease in the agricultural dominance class. Um, so that means uh, the dominant class for that pixel. 
um, we see an increase in development and the natural dominance class is actually relatively stable. So I also did analysis looking just at forest pixels that were forested in two, uh, 2001 and similar trends. We have a decrease in agricultural, we have an increase in development uh, and a decrease um, in natural. And overall, there is a, a net loss of forest. So the key message here is that although the forest might be stable, the landscape context surrounding these forests is changing. Um, another way to look at this landscape context, um, and one of the things that our group is interested in, is what's actually happening around our national forest. So on the left-hand column, these are all the national forests, all of your national forest in the southern region. Um, and we're looking at, again, those dominance class for land use, natural, agricultural, developed. And then this mixed category means there, one is not um, really dominant over the other. Um, and what we found was that um, overall, uh, there's been some movement an increase in natural area surround, uh, surrounding the national forest that correspond with a decrease in agriculture um, and a decrease in that mixed category, but there has been some increase in, in development. Um, Another way for us to, to look at this um, is, is just looking at tree cover. So we can sort of simplify it to say, if we're really interested in forests, let's just look at the tree cover. Um, so here is three images, again, picking out the Atlanta metropolitan area. So we have land cover in 1999 to, and then in 2019. And you know, if we just look between those two maps and the green is showing us trees, it's hard to pull out a difference. It looks like, you know, our forests are pretty stable, which uh, we showed by our, our summaries too. Um, but then the last image, now we're, we're seeing the pink, which is areas that were tree cover that have now um, gone into another land classification. Um, so we are seeing some forest loss. Again, using the example for Asheville, um, pretty continuous forest surrounding Asheville. And, and we know that we you know, are fortunate to be uh, surrounded by national forests. Uh, but then again, if we look in 2019 at the changes in these two decades, uh, we can see indications of forest loss. Another way uh, for us to, to look at this is to think about tree cover density. Um, so this map is showing, if we look at a neighborhood surrounding a pixel, what is the percentage of tree cover? So not just is the pixel itself forest, but is it surrounded by forest and how much? Um, so, in this map, we're looking at the percent of tree cover, zero to 100. And the dark blue is indicating close to 100% uh, tree cover. So I think the thing to, to notice, um, and that I noticed in my hiking uh, in this region, and then also in the Pacific Northwest is, um, you know, in the Southeast, there's a lot of forested area. Um, it's really dominant on the landscape, but the forest density might be lower um, than some other regions like the Pacific Northwest where the forest, um, forest areas cover smaller extent, but are at higher density. So in summary, the landscape context is changing. And looking at, um, you know, from 2001 to 2016, we saw an increase in development, both the intensification and the extentification. And again, outward from the urban centers. 
we've seen a, seen a decrease in agricultural area. Um, and we know that that's due to some farmland abandonment and also development pressures. And the extent of the natural area was relatively stable. We did see some forest loss in the examples that I showed you. Um, but the overall forest context is changing. So um, we're, we're gonna take another moment to, to go on a, a long walk. Um, this is a photograph from the Pacific Crest Trail um, in Oregon. Um, so where we left off in our, in our walking journey. Um, so I, I graduated high school and went on a long walk. Um, and then I went back, back to Oregon where I was living. Um, and I did my undergraduate studies at University of Oregon. You got to tell me in chat if any of you are ducks. I got to know. Um, but I studied environmental science there, and that's where I really got interested in ecology and forest biology. Um, and, and after uh, I graduated, I ended up um, doing a lot of different jobs. I was trying my hat at different things um, as a technician in biology, doing field research, um, and then also doing environmental education. So I got to see all the ecosystems in Oregon and, and work there. So, you know, leading tide pool walks on the Oregon coast and studying sagebrush um, in, this, in the high desert. So really got to have some great experiences. And, um, but one of my journeys in, in 2010, I decided I wanted to walk across Oregon. Again, I like jumping in the deep end. Why not just walk across the state? Um, so I set out and and I, I did it this time with a lighter pack. Um, I definitely learned a lot of things since my, my last long walk. Um, but on, on this walk, you know, I had some ecology um, knowledge in, in my uh, pack, packed with me, if you will. Um, and so I was noticing a lot more that was going on the landscape, you know, some of the more subtle things that um, I hadn't noticed before, where as you know, land use change, well, anybody notice when you cross a road, right? Or you, or you climb over a fence. Um, but, you know, now I knew some of the trees and I knew something about the ecosystems and I could notice some other changes. Um, but one of the, the funny things was, um, you know, I was just walking across the state. So I was doing it at a kind of moderate pace, like 10 miles a day. Um, but some of you might be, uh, you know, through hikers or know people that are, and they're doing the whole Pacific Crest Trail and, you know, three or four months, thousands of miles. And so those folks were doing like 30 miles a day. Um, and I like to call them trail bombers because they would just like zoom past you on the trail, just bombing down the trail. Um, and one of these people, you know, were just crossing paths and really short interaction and um, but, you know, we were chatting, and I was like, well, you know, what do you think so far? Like, what do you think of Oregon? And they were like, you know, Oregon's just been boring. It's, it's just trees. It's just a bunch of trees. <laughs> um, anyway, and I, I remember that because I thought it was really funny because, um, you know, I, I guess they were seeing the forest for trees. They were just seeing the forest, um, but they, they were missing so much, right? And, and I was thinking about how, you know, that day I had been watching the transition from lower elevation um, Western hemlock crossing up, um, going higher into the mountain hemlock and how neat that was to see that transition and knowing that, you know, the species could survive at, at different elevations due to their, um, you know, thresholds for, for um, sustaining the, the cold winters. Um, so, and, and I also saw, um, you know, other change, other more dramatic changes, right? So like in this picture, we can see sagebrush 
And then in the distance, we can see a sparse forested area. And then beyond that, we can see more dense forest. So there was, in my mind, huge variation, um, even within a short distance. So um, to go back to our, our story of, of the Southeast, we can again turn to satellite data uh, to look at these changes in composition and productivity of, of forests. Um, so one of the ways that we can do this is using what's called the normalized difference difference vegetation index. And I promise this is the headiest slide we're going to have. Um, so uh, basically, satellites um, are measuring the reflectance of the surface of the Earth. And they're measuring um, the red and near-infrared reflected light channels. And from that, we can actually measure how much chlorophyll um, not borophyll, but how much chlorophyll, the green stuff in plants, um, is absorbing visible light and how much is getting reflected back. And we can actually tell the density of the vegetation in a given area. Um, so this figure is showing that NDVI or greenness, we can simplify it to call it greenness, of the, the surface of the earth or the forest canopy, if we're looking at forest. Um, and we can measure it over time. And, and the thing to note here too, is that um, we can see the seasonality. So as, um, uh, as spring, as we're experiencing right now, we have this beautiful green up of vegetation and we're gonna see that greenness increase. And then uh, you know, it'll, it'll peak sometime in the summer and then fall will come and the leaves will start turning. And if it's a deciduous forest, a lot of the leaves um, are going to be um, lost and we'll see a decrease in that, that overall greenness. And so that's why we see this oscillation in the graph. Um, so we can see this season, you know, change with the season, but then also if we can look at the change over time in the total um, height of NDVI or the peak NDVI um, and how that might be changing over time. So in the, in the lower figure, um, this is just showing um, if we think about the calendar, you know, as a circular calendar year, we can plot these greenness points in the calendar and it can um, be a way for us to see the overall seasonality um, of, of a given pixel. Um, so here we're using this remotely sensed greenness information um, to take a look at how the forest canopy is changing. Um, so it is just looking at the, the surface of the canopy. Um, and here we're looking at the overall, um, how, how dynamic the landscape is over time or the proportion of change from year to year. So again, if we think about those year oscillations, how much are those changing year to year? And then through a time period, is it relatively stable or are we seeing lots of change? Um, so the example here, we're looking at Francis Marion National Forest. Maybe some of you have been there um, on the coast of, of South Carolina. And it's showing this forest change indicator um, from 2000 to 2018, the dark green areas mean that it's relatively stable. Um, and then moving into the warm colors, the red areas mean there's been a lot of change or fluctuation in that greenness in this time period. A little closer to home, this is looking at Nanahala National Forest. Um, and again, showing Green is, is areas that are more stable and the warmer colors, um, there's been more change over time. Well, again, uh, we're interested in, in you know, comparing how the national forests are doing relative to each other. Um, so this forest change metric that we're looking at 
in the map is this middle column. So again, that year to year change. Um, and we're actually looking at a landscape scale. And um, if I use the term landscape, it means basically a neighborhood of pixels. Um, so again, not just one pixel, but what's happening in a, in a group of pixels. So similar to when we were looking at forest density, like how dense is the forest around a pixel, but here we're looking at how much change is happening around a given pixel, and then summing it for all the pixels within a national forest. Um, so we can see that there, there is variation um, in, in space for the southern region for this year-to-year -year change, and then through time, because it's this indicator of, of change through time. So there's actually a lot of change happening in this forest canopy. Um, the column on the left is looking at the total amount of change um, in indicators of seasonality and productivity and timing um, from the beginning of the time period, so 2000 to 2008. So that's the absolute change, like beginning to end. Um, and we can see that uh, a lot of the forests are experiencing change um, in, in this indication as well. Um, so we're seeing change you know, from the beginning to an end of a time period. So that's kind of overall change. But then again, with the middle column, we know that uh, there's actually a lot of change happening between those years as well. Um, and then the last column, uh, again, we can use this greenness um, measurement, quantified in a, a different way, uh, to look at um, if those changes are actually uh, causing a, a bigger shift than a baseline normal um, in, in the composition. And that's what we're looking at here. And so even though there's a lot of changes, for a lot of these national forests, the composition is actually staying the same. Um, but for some of them, there is indication of, of, of compositional shifts. So um, again, folks, we're interested in what's happening surrounding our national forests. So here we're looking at Francis Marion again, um, but the yellow is outlining um, the areas that actually is owned and operated or managed by the National Forest or the Forest Service. Um, and then I looked at this buffer around um, the area and that's shown in purple. So in this case, we're looking at a three kilometer buffer. So what's happening right at the boundaries of our national forests. So we're looking at the same indicators as before, and there's a ton of bars here. So I'm just going to uh, give you the big picture. Um, overall, the, the lighter color bars are the, those buffers surrounding the national forest. And the, the thing that jumps out at us is that for most places, those bars are, are bigger than the national forest. So the buffers or the areas surrounding national forests are more dynamic. There's, there's more change happening uh, than within the National Forest Interior. Um, and so, you know, there um, can be important similarities and differences between uh, the national forests of, of the Southeast. Um, so some of them are experiencing more dynamics than others. And part of my research is figuring out, well, what is that really mean? So how are the forests changing? So, you know, we have these indicators of, of changing canopy, but what does that mean on the ground? Ooh, sorry. Um, so, you know, for, for some of these instances, we have an idea of what's happening on the ground. So, so at the top here, this is a, a picture of um, some die off due to the hemlock woolly adelgid of, of hemlock trees. And that is, shows up in our greenness signal. And so we can actually map out areas that have, have seen this shift in their uh, species composition of trees, looking at how that greenness in the winter time particularly has, has declined. So um, if we think about evergreen forest, 
are evergreen. So their, their greenness is gonna stay high in the winter, um, but a forest that is mixed uh, of evergreen and deciduous or, or trees that lose their leaves um, is actually gonna uh, have a lower greenness in the, the winter. And so we can actually uh, observe that change in composition by looking at the change in greenness. Um, and then we also have these under, other indicators of just how dynamic, how much is there fluctuating um, from year to year. And so, you know, from these maps and, and the summary tables, we know that there is a lot of dynamic change happening in, in the forest canopy. Um, and I'm optimistic that we're uh, gonna be able to tease apart what this can be telling us about changes in composition um, or productivity um, and the drivers of those change. Okay, so we're going back um, to, to the, the, my journey, my personal journey. Um, so part of the purpose really of my, my long walk across Oregon was I was thinking about grad school. You know, I had been working in the field for a while. Um, I was trying to, to figure out what, what my next steps were. Um, and when I was doing that walk, I, I was thinking about the research I had been doing uh, so far. And a, a lot of those projects, um, we're doing plot level studies and I loved it. Um, what it meant was, you know, we were counting individual plants within a plot. Um, and, and looking at their, uh, their effect on the population over time. Um, and, and I really thought, you know, I, I think my place is, is studying the bigger picture and wanting to look at this landscape scale. So again, seeing, seeing the forest for the trees. So what's happening overall to our forest at, at a grander scale and, and not necessarily what's happening to, to one individual tree. Um, so I ended up pursuing my graduate studies at Montana State University, um, and I started off um, by doing some field work looking at fire particularly and looking at uh, tree mortality, um, pre and post fire, um, and also the amount of fuels on the ground. And so this is a picture from my, my first field season in Montana. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was just a wonderful experience. Um, the, the overall thing I was looking at was interactions of, of vegetation and fire and climate. So again, this curiosity about how um, these different drivers of forest change are, are interacting with each other uh, to cause these patterns on the landscape that we can see. Well, while I was at grad school, um, 2016, uh, there was the most active fire year in Yellowstone National Park uh, since 1988. Um, and we actually saw some forests that had burned in 1988 reburn. And that's um, what's shown here. So we know that fire dynamics are really changing. Um, and to bring it back home here, um, a lot of you probably remember the fires of 2016 in the Southeast. And, and that was kind of a, a game changer for, for folks out here um, because it was the first time uh, there was uh, a significant number of fires burning and folks were affected by the smoke. And I think it made people more aware of, of the changing um, wildfire that we're, we're seeing. Um, and so in 2016, there was like 33 different fires in the Southeast and I think um, 90,000 acres burned um, here as well. Um, so we know that that forest disturbance, particularly fire um, is, is changing and is changing our forests. So again, we can turn to uh, satellite data. And for this, this is a data set called the North American Forest Dynamics data set and an attribution type because they're trying to 
attribute um, the changes that they see in their satellite images to particular um, agents of disturbance. So this is a map again of, of the Southeast um, and the time period that, that they measured was from 1986 to 2010. Um, and so the green is showing areas of forest that are relatively stable. And so we're, we're gonna be looking at this data more. And the, so the thing I want uh, you to remember is that it's just stable in terms of there hasn't been a large um, severity, which means a lot of trees killed in this case. There haven't been a lot of trees killed by a disturbance over a large area um, that's been detected by this data set. So as we saw earlier, we know there's lots of changes happening in the forest, um, you know, composition shifts, seasonality shifts. Um, but in this case, we're just looking at disturbance. So the green means there hasn't been a major disturbance in that time period that's been detected by satellites. Um, and the, this kind of teal color is showing harvest um, in this time period and the orange is showing fire. So, so far in this time period for the Southeast, fire hasn't been, or rather high severity fire hasn't been a, a main driver of forest change here. But the question is how that might change in the future. But we can see that, that harvest has a really strong signal in this area. So again, taking a look at um, the national forest in Southeast. And so in this map, you can actually see all of your public lands that are operated by the Forest Service uh, in the Southern region are outlined by yellow. And so um, these tables are showing the percentage of the forest area within those national forests that are either stable or have been affected by disturbance. And we're just looking at harvest and fire um, because across the region, uh, the other disturbance agents that are, are measured by this data set, like wind or um, conversion, were uh, a very small percentage. They were less than 1%. So the thing to, to notice is that um, in terms of disturbance, our, our national forests are very stable or have been in this time period. Um, although there has been a strong harvest signal and, and fire activity. Um, but one of the key takeaways here is that um, I also in this figure put on uh, all of region eight. So that's all the forested areas across the Southeast um, that aren't designated as national forests, which is about 80% of the forested area. And what we can see is that most of the national forests um, are much more stable than the, the rest of um, our forested area and the region. So um, I wish we were in public and then you could raise your hands, um, but how many of you have gone hiking in the Nantahala National Forest? Um, this is one of the gyms near us that we get to take advantage of in the corner, uh, southwest corner of North Carolina. Um, so this is showing the Nantahala and the boundaries outlined in yellow. Um, and again, green is stable. And so we can see that for this national forest, it's been very stable. Um, and in fact, to go back here, um, the examples I'm using are Nantahala because it was the most stable. Um, of the, the national forests. And then we're gonna look at the Francis Marion, which is at the bottom that had uh, the most disturbance in this time period. So here's the Francis Marion. So really different signal, right? Um, so there's been fire activity, there's been harvest. Um, and then this was the one national forest that actually had a, a significant amount of wind disturbance. Um, which was related to the hurricane. Uh, and it was about 5.5% of, of the area um, was disturbed by wind. So again, if we look at those buffers surrounding um, the national forest, uh, we can 
uh, notice some some differences. So again, those light the lighter color means that it's a buffer surrounding the forest. And so um, the lighter bars, if we look at stable, we can see that uh, the buffers are less stable than the designated national forest. They also experience more harvest. Um, but interestingly, uh, we do see more fire activity within the national forest than um, compared to its, its surrounding. So our, our big takeaways, um, there's no denying that harvest is the, the dominant disturbance agent in our region. And national forests are less disturbed than the other forested areas. Um, and the forest interiors, interiors are also less disturbed than the surrounding landscape. Um, but overall, uh, the forest dynamics and disturbance in this case are, are cha again changing this landscape context, um, and they're highly variable um, across the region as we saw by our, our extreme examples of the national forest. Um, so for today's presentation, uh, you know, we really focused on looking at land use change and disturbance, uh, and then these indicators of forest canopy change or land surface phenology, which, and shown here is again, that, that greenness indicator that we, that we looked at. Um, but the longer term goal of my project is to also integrate climate data to look at how climate context is changing the landscape. Um, and, and then ultimately to link all of that remotely sensed data to measurements on the ground of forest conditions. So things like um, the structural stage or the forest type. And why we wanna do this integration um, in this next phase of research. Um, so, you know, so far we, we were doing the what, where, when. So what's changing, where is it changing, and, and these different indicators of change. But ultimately, we want to integrate to answer some why questions uh, to have a better understanding. So particularly, how are these, how are forest conditions on the ground? And then the dynamics, the landscape scale um, related uh, to the climate and surrounding land use context. To what extent do the currently measurable dis, uh, disturbance and recovery explain forest dynamics that are characterized by changes in phenology? Um, so really that canopy um, shifts in greenness that we talked about. And when and where do existing land use and climate contexts place desirable forest conditions at, at risk, because again, ultimately our mandate um, is to, pr uh, to provide resilient forests. Um, so to kind of bring it full circle, um, my, my journey that's included a lot of long walks um, has, has brought me back full circle. Um, so this is a picture from Looking Glass, which some of you may have hiked, um, that's uh, pretty close to Asheville. Um, and I did this hike this year because uh, my journey has brought me back here. So it's been 20 years um, since I was, uh, did my first long walk uh, in the Appalachian Trail in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, and I found my, myself back here. Um, and interestingly enough, all of the things you saw in this presentation is a study of the change that's happened in that time period. So, you know, two decades of change in the forest um, over that time period. Um, so uh, with that, I, I hope you enjoyed my presentation and um, I hope it inspires you when you're going on, on long walks or short walks um, to pay more attention to your surroundings and, and to see if you can notice some of these shifts, you know, are you passing different land uses while you're on your walk? Um, are you seeing the, the types of trees change? Um, so even, you know, hiking and looking grass, uh, you can see the different uh, trees change as you, as you go up in elevation. Um, 
And also, are you seeing indicators of, of disturbances on the landscape? So I hope that um, through this presentation, it's, it's helped you see the forest for the trees and, and that you can take this with you when you go out exploring. Um, so with that, again, I want to thank my collaborators um, at the Forest Service and my emails there if you want to reach out to me about anything you saw in this presentation. And of course, I need to thank the Forest Service for my funding as well, because um, they made this research possible. Um, so with that, I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so I'm not sure how do y'all typically moderate questions. I can, I'll open my chat, but. Yeah, I, I usually will read out what went on in the chat and we'll kind of run through it and then open up the floor if anybody wants to kind of just raise their hand. Cool. Um, let's see, we, we had somebody who was a beaver family connection, but not a duck. So we had that. Um, That's cool. Rusty asked, does USDA have its own satellites for these studies? Yeah, so, so we don't, so we're relying on, on other people's satellites. Um, so if in my presentation, uh, I think most of the satellites were uh, NASA based satellites. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't have our own, but that's a good question. For instance, it was just uh, Robert and I asking questions. We'll just run through his questions first. Um, he asked, what can you say affects the mega drought in the West on forests out there? Okay, so I think what affects the mega drought or what maybe, affects have- Robert, the if you want to clarify the question. I'm sorry, that was that was my question. I was just wondering, uh, there have been so many articles on how bad the water situation is out there. So what can you see from the satellites? Do you see, I mean, it looked to me like maybe we're, the forests aren't so dense where the where the uh, drought is in, in, in the Southwest. So maybe maybe forests aren't a good indicator of what's happening, but does that make yeah, sense? So, yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. So I know, um, I guess the first thing I should uh, say or disclaim is that um, I haven't looked at climate data with the satellite uh, images that you saw in this presentation yet. Um, so I think I mentioned at the end that that's like the next step is to link it to also changing climate context. So I personally haven't done that research yet for the Southeast. Um, what I can say is that other people are, are looking at that already. Um, and you know, in the West we've seen um, really extreme mortality events uh, due to drought. And they haven't seen um, that in the Southeast yet. So um, I, I, I can tell you that much, but um, it's, it's definitely a, an active area of, of research. Um, and if you want, I can send you, again, it's not my research, so I don't wanna speak too much to it, but Robert, if you're interested, you can shoot me an email and I can send you uh, to some uh, studies that are looking at, at drought in the Southeast. And particularly effects on forests, I guess I should say. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, let's see, I, I asked, is the increase of natural context in surrounding the forest, the national forest, due to nonprofit organization efforts to put land into conservation easements? Yeah, um, I can't say. Um, so we do have um, data about land ownership. Um, so I'd, I'd have to take a look at that of, of who actually is owning the area surrounding the forest. Um, and it, it's really dependent on which national forest we're talking about too. Um, so for example, like the Nanahala um, is quite stable, but it's also surrounded by the Cherokee National Forest and the Pisgah National Forest. So that is its context is other national forests, right? Um, whereas some of them that might have um, other ownership surrounding um, that would have more of an impact. So I can't speak to that specifically, um, but it's an interesting thing to, to look at. Great, thank you. Um, and then another question that I had was just, how do you differentiate 
clearings as non-production clearings, such as balds versus agricultural clearings? Because I imagine the context of an agricultural clearing versus, you know, a natural bald or a semi-natural bald is very different. Yeah, um, so the, the disturbance data set that we were looking at um, is actually uh, created by satellite images, but also by humans. Um, so they, uh, they actually had a team of people looking at um, pixels. So they you know, ran an algorithm that showed them if there had been a change um, in a pixel, and then they looked at the image and actually cataloged um, uh, those images as, as what was going on. So if it had been a, a harvest or if it had been a conversion, which the agricultural, um, if it was forced to, to agriculture, then that would be considered a conversion. Um, so they were actually looking at um, like Google map images, right, that, that you can look at in the sense of um, they could actually see if it was a forest or if it was a crop field. Um, and that's how they they did their attribution. Um, and then they used all that data uh, to train. So, so they didn't do it for every single pixel across the US. They did have thousands of pixels that they trained. Um, and then, then they ran a computer to do all the rest of the pixels following the, um, the training that they'd come up with. So, um, I guess it's a long way of saying that uh, humans are still better at looking at pictures and saying, yeah, that looks like it's, it's a crop field um, uh, than computers alone. Um, although they did end up then, um, you know, using the human input data to, to train uh, the computer to, to reclassify the other ones. Very cool. It's like the, uh, the Google CAPTCHA training. Um, all right, and let's see. Um, Robert had another question. Can satellite imaging pick up and help manage forest pest invasions? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I didn't you know, present on that here, um, and it wasn't really the focus of the disturbance data set that I shared with you, because um, they were looking at real high severity um, and extent. Um, but yes, um, so what I, I will mention um, a product from the Southern Research Station called Forewarn. Um, and so it's using the same, uh, that greenness indicator that I showed you, normalized difference vegetation index. It's based on that. Um, and they do a really great job at looking at the changes in that, that signal. So that wave, right, um, to be able to detect um, different insect outbreaks. Um, but it works best in areas where, um, you know, the, the top of the canopy is affected. Because again, those satellite images were, we can do the best job at seeing what's at the surface of the earth, which in the case of forest means the top of the forest canopy. So like for hemlock woolly adelgid, that's one example where you can see it in satellite images, but you're only gonna see it where you're seeing die off of the top of the canopy, whereas if there's hemlocks in the understory that are being affected, that's not going to get detected. Um, so um, that that is something to keep in mind. But yeah, folks can check out Forewarn. It's open to the public. Um, I, can, I guess I can put that in chat too. I'll put the link there. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll open up the floor if anybody has any other questions they want to ask before we sign off. Open it up, you can unmute yourself. All right, well, I guess we will conclude. Oh, and there's the link in the chat. Great, thank you. We'll conclude this talk. Thank you all for showing up. Um, that was great information. Really cool to see how large scale data works like that. Um, yeah, uh, I'll link again to our YouTube channel. This was recorded. Um, so if you want to revisit and see the data sets again, I'm sure you can go check that out. Um, and I will also put our donation links. We are trying to cover our meetup.com funds. So if you can donate, that would be amazing. 
Um, we will be hosting some more talks coming up, so please um, stay tuned for those. You'll get your email notifications and you can check our meetup page. All right, Stephen, do you have any other announcements to? No, just thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, thanks, Kristen, for uh, your talk and your sharing. I'm so inspired to go out hiking now and, and look at forest uh, changes. And uh, stay tuned to the uh, AST uh, meetup page for uh, future talks. And hope you all see it. Hope to see you all at talk again soon. Great. Yeah. Thanks again for inviting me. Uh, this was fun. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see y'all in person when we're, we're able to do that. Um, I did drop my email in chat. It's just my full name at usda.gov. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. That's good. Thanks, everyone. Take good care. Hey, Kristen. It's Dakota. <laughs>